Good morning. As I was eating breakfast this morning, there was thunder and lightning and heavy rain, and I thought, there's not going to be anybody at church. And uh, I believe we have a few more than usual here today, so I think next Sunday we'll be praying for rain. No, I will not, because we're going to be outdoors next Sunday. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll pray that we don't, don't have that, but uh, we're looking forward to that next Sunday. Uh, for our outdoor uh, Easter morning service and uh, hope that you can come and be a part of that. We have a tent, by the way, so if there is any uh, moisture falling, we'll be protected from it. But we're looking forward to a great time of worship uh, together next Sunday. From a purely statistical point of view, the future of Christianity, particularly in the United States, does not look very bright. For the last few decades, sociologists and scholars of religion have been noting the decline in the numbers of attendees in various uh, denominations, noting that there are a few exceptions, but overall painting a very bleak picture. And some have even said that if present trends continue, that it won't be very many more decades until the church will be no more unless those trends are reversed. Well, those people are forgetting a few things. They're forgetting, first of all, that the church is not a human institution. They're forgetting that it belongs to Jesus Christ. They're forgetting that it belongs to the one who said, upon this rock I will build my church, and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'm convinced that the church will be here as long as Jesus wants it to be. Are you? Not one second more and not one second less, but it is his church. They're also forgetting that while Christianity may be declining in the United States, in other parts of the world, it's seeing tremendous growth. Uh, in parts of uh, Asia, Africa, and South America, there are churches that are being planted uh, everywhere, even among these refugee populations that you read about. Uh, these masses of people living in refugee camps, there is a lot of evangelism going on and new churches being established in those very camps. People are being brought to faith in Jesus Christ. They're forgetting also that Christianity has always, always been a minority movement and that we can live with that. We know how to do that. It's been our history. We may not have always sensed it. We may not have always felt it, but it's always been the case and it always will be. And they forget that at those times when the church has been under greatest pressure, that it has tended to thrive the most. And so if we come under the greater pressure, then we should see the greater growth. But most of all, most of all, they're forgetting Daniel chapter 2. They're forgetting what that great visionary of God had to say about God's kingdom, which in his day was in the far distant future. And that's where the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar comes in, the dream and its interpretation. We studied the first uh, 30 verses of this last Sunday leading up to this. And we didn't talk about the dream itself or about its interpretation. So this morning, we want to talk about that. Nebuchadnezzar, according to verses 1 to 30, had a nightmare. And it may have been a recurring nightmare. We don't know. He may have just had it once or he may have had it several times, but he knew that it must mean something, but he had no idea what. And so he brought in all of the wizards and the enchanters and the magicians and the sorcerers and the astrologers and this whole faculty of uh, Babylonian wise men and said, tell me what my dream was. And they said, well, you tell us the dream and we'll tell you the interpretation. And he said, no, 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 you're not getting off that easy. You tell me the dream and then tell me its interpretation or I'm going to kill you and destroy your houses. Well, they begged and begged, tell us the dream. Nobody can do what you're asking. Tell us the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. He said, no. And so he ordered them all killed. Now that included Daniel and his three friends because they were being trained for that, those positions as wise men among the Babylonians. And yet Daniel was brought in and had told Arioch, the king's commander, that he could interpret the dream. 
But when he was standing before Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar said, can you tell me the dream and its interpretation? And Daniel said, no one, no human being on earth can do that, O king, but there is a God in heaven, and he will tell the king its dream and its interpretation. And that's what brings us to verse 31. And first of all, let's talk about the dream. It was kind of a scary dream. Daniel says that it was frightening, it was, but it's also a pretty simple dream. Nebuchadnezzar saw a human figure with a head of gold, and then it had a chest and arms of silver, and the lower torso was of bronze, and then the legs and the feet were of iron, the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And so it was a human figure, apparently a gigantic human figure. And then he saw a stone that was cut by no human hand. And that stone was cast at this image and struck it in the feet. And the whole image collapsed. And then the whole thing was just pulverized so that the wind came along and just blew it away. Remember, that's gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And it was all just pulverized by this huge stone. And then that stone began to grow and it grew into a mountain. And it kept growing until it filled the whole earth. And Daniel said, that was your dream, O king. Well, what did the dream mean? What was its interpretation? Well, it turns out this dream was more than just a dream. It was a prophecy. It was a prophecy about things to come. It was a prophecy about a series of kingdoms, consecutive kingdoms that were going to come. And it started with the kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar was the head of, the Babylonian kingdom. You, O king, are the head of gold. But he said, after you will come another kingdom. And that's the one represented by uh, the silver. And then there will be the bronze and then the iron. And notice that he said these other kingdoms will be inferior to yours. And that's indicated by the declining value of the metals, gold, silver, bronze, iron. And he continued to explain to him that they would be inferior to his kingdom. And I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar liked that. At first, until it dawned on him that what Daniel was saying is, your kingdom isn't going to last. Your kingdom is going to be replaced by other kingdoms. You will not be the head of a long line of Babylonian kings. Your kingdom isn't going to be around that long. But then the stone cut by no human hand, would eventually destroy all of them as powerful as they were. And then it not only would destroy those kingdoms, it would replace them until it filled the whole earth. And that's where it gets really good. That's where it gets really good because the stone which grows to fill the whole earth, he says, is another kingdom, but it's not like those first four. He said, this kingdom is set up by God himself. It's not a human kingdom. It won't have a human ruler like Nebuchadnezzar. It is the kingdom of God. This kingdom will break in pieces all the other kingdoms. There will be no comparison so much greater than the kingdom even of gold. And this kingdom will never, ever be destroyed. Daniel 2, verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, never, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people, and it shall stand forever. That, Nebuchadnezzar, he says, is your dream. Well, that was impressive, wasn't it? But it still leaves a lot of unanswered questions. For example, it doesn't answer the question of, well, what are those successive kingdoms? Notice Daniel says nothing about that. It doesn't answer the question of, what is that stone that destroys all the kingdoms, including that of Nebuchadnezzar? And, and third, what is the kingdom that shall never be destroyed? What is that exactly? 
And Daniel doesn't answer any of those questions. He just tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream, and he says, here's the interpretation of it. And he doesn't identify those kingdoms that are to follow Nebuchadnezzar's or specify what that eternal kingdom is or what that stone is that smashes them. Let's let Scripture answer that for us. Let's let Scripture tell us, first of all, the answer to that third question. What is that kingdom? that will replace all of the other kingdoms and never be destroyed. Well, I think it's pretty clear when you look at the rest of Scripture, that's the kingdom Jesus came to establish. That's the one that John read to us about a few minutes ago, Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19, when Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he said to the apostles, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven so that whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you have loosed on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So he draws a very close correlation between that church he's going to establish and that kingdom. Now, to be clear, the kingdom is more than just the church. The kingdom is a greater concept than simply the church, but it includes it. Because the kingdom, according to the Old Testament, was already in existence. God's kingdom, he was already reigning. But there was this earthly manifestation of it that was coming that Jesus was going to bring. And then there is a heavenly manifestation of it that is to come even further down the road. The coming of God's kingdom is a progressive thing. It's not a one-time event. You get something else about this in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's clearly talking about the same kingdom as Daniel 2.44. And it's brought about, he says, because the Ancient of Days gives that authority, that kingdom to this one like a son of man. Do you remember reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, how Jesus preferred to refer to himself? He called himself the son of man. He called himself the son of man. So that in people's minds, had they been familiar with Daniel, and most of them were, they would hear that and they would think, what is he saying? What's he claiming to be? He's claiming to be that son of man to whom God has given all authority. And at the end of his ministry, after his resurrection, he says it, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. That's the kingdom that he's talking about. It's obviously the same as Daniel 2.44, to be brought about by one like a son of man. And the kingdom is his ruling authority over the whole earth. And the kingdom, you remember, was the main theme of Jesus' preaching. You look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. And Mark says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He was proclaiming the gospel. What was that gospel? The time is fulfilled. What time? The time Daniel had foretold is now fulfilled. The time the other prophets had foretold is now fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand, he said. The kingdom was at hand. The kingdom was present because Jesus himself was present. He said so in Matthew 12, verse 28. If it's by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Notice the past tense. The kingdom of God has come upon you, he said. So the kingdom was present because Jesus was present. But yet there's that other dimension of the kingdom. That even though Jesus has come, and even though the church has been established, is still to come. There is a kingdom to which you and I look forward. We've been singing about it this morning, haven't we? We've been singing about being a part of it. We've been singing about being there in the presence of God. When Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, uh, that he was going to build his church, he tied that very closely to the concept of kingdom in verse 19. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, Paul said this, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You see, pre-Christ, we were all living in the dominion of darkness. 
We were all living in the shadow of death. But now we've been transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Believers in Christ, his church, are already in that kingdom, but there's still more to come because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And then he talks about the resurrection and how at the resurrection he says we will all be changed. We'll all be changed. Isn't that great? I'm looking forward to that. The more I look in the mirror, the more I'm looking forward to being changed. We'll all be changed. Why? So we'll look better? No, so we, so we will be of such a nature that we can inherit that kingdom in God's presence forever. Flesh and blood can't do that. It's got to be transformed and that's going to happen at the resurrection, he says. And here's the way Peter put it. So there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 11. There will be richly provided for you. We've already been transferred into that kingdom, Paul said in Colossians 1.13. But there is that other aspect, that other dimension of the kingdom still to come. And we'll be transferred into that. Well, that answers question number one, I think. That kingdom uh, about which Paul, uh, Daniel uh, was telling Nebuchadnezzar is nothing other than the kingdom of Christ. But what are those successive kingdoms in Nebuchadnezzar's nightmare? What about that? The, silver, or the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron. Well, when was Jesus born? When did he come and bring that kingdom to earth? He was born during the reign of the Roman Empire. That part that was iron with the feet that are partly iron and clay, the iron rule of Rome. He was born during that time. What was the kingdom that preceded that? It was the kingdom of Greece. And notice what Daniel said about that. The kingdom that shall rule over all the earth. Did you know that Alexander the Great famously wept in, when he was yet in his 20s because there were no more worlds to conquer? He'd done it all. He'd done it all. No more worlds to conquer. So that's that kingdom of uh, bronze. Uh, and then before the Greeks, there was the Persian, or sometimes referred to as the Medo-Persian kingdom. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 31 tells us that Daniel was there in the court of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon until the first year of King Cyrus, who was a Persian king, and then chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, describes the night that King Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, died, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. So that Persian kingdom is the kingdom of silver, and Nebuchadnezzar's own kingdom is the head of gold. So you have the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, and the Roman kingdoms. And in the days of those kings, Daniel says, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. So in the interpretation of his dream, Nebuchadnezzar was finding out that he will not be the first in a long line of Babylonian kings. He finds out that there is a definite expiration date stamped on his kingdom. It's going to be over and it's not going to last all that long. And it's been put there by the same God who is now revealing his dream. Remember what Daniel had said earlier in chapter 1 and chapter 2, early, earlier part of chapter 2, that God sets up kings and he brings them down. And now he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, you've been set there by God and you will be brought down by that same God. Well, that brings us to question number two then. What is that stone cut out by no human hand? That stone that struck that image and just pulverized it so that the wind could just blow it away. That stone that was more powerful than all of those empires put together. Well, I'd say that has to be the Jesus and his kingdom, don't you? That's what's represented in that stone. Verse 44, in the days of those kings, the Romans, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Verse 45 says it a second time that the stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand. 
This is not some sort of mega kingdom that he's talking about. This is not somebody that attains world domination because they outmaneuver everybody else. This is a kingdom established by God himself. He is in charge of the world. He's in char charge of all the empires, all the kingdoms, uh, and he is going to set up one that is going to be greater than all of them. And then verse 40, uh, 35 says, The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You remember what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah chapter 2? He said, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will stand as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of God. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the God of Jacob, and we may learn his ways. That mountain, that stone that grows into a mountain. And when Jesus sent out his disciples, what did he tell them? Go and make disciples of all the nations. Bring them all into that kingdom, he says. And you remember how scripture speaks of Jesus as a stone that the builders rejected, but it has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That's what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was all about. What a dream. What an interpretation. What a future. And Nebuchadnezzar was overwhelmed by it all. So overwhelmed that he, the, the most powerful king on earth at that time, according to verse 46, fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel, who was a slave, a captive. And he confessed that truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. And he made Daniel second in command over the whole empire. And Daniel said, but don't forget my three friends over here. And so he brought them along too. And he put them in positions of power and authority. But I want you to notice something carefully. Being impressed by God is not the same thing as being converted to God. And Nebuchadnezzar was impressed, but he was not converted in the very next chapter, he sets up a gold image, probably of himself, and demanded that everybody worship it on pain of death. He was every bit the pagan after his dream experience that he was before. Every bit the pagan. He just learned about the God of Israel. He just learned about Daniel's God. And he said, oh good, I have one more, one more God to put on the shelf. I've got one more God to help me accomplish my dreams. I've got one more God to do my bidding. I've got one more God to help me out and make me stronger. It's all about him. It was not about God. No matter what he says, it was still about him. And he was unchanged and he was unconverted. Do you suppose that ever happens today? Do you suppose there are people who learn about God and they're impressed by God and they're impressed by what they learn about Jesus Christ? But their hearts are never changed. And they just turn and go away as unbelieving as they were in the beginning. They're aware of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. They're knowing that the kingdom has indeed come by no human hand, and yet they choose not to be part of it. That's Nebuchadnezzar. That's a lot of people today. You know, Nebuchadnezzar should have learned two things from his experience. He should have learned, number one, that God is fully in control and was in control of him and his life, and that he could bring it to an end in a moment's notice. That God was fully in control. And he should have learned that God is merciful. Because God was giving him warning. You're temporary, brother. That's what he was saying to him. You're not going to be here long. You better face up to that. You'd better be ready for that. You'd better do something about that. It's what Nebuchadnezzar should have learned. It's no different for you and me. That's what we need to learn. God rules over all. 
The kingdom is his kingdom, and he calls us all into that kingdom through his son. And he's merciful because he's giving us all another opportunity to be converted, to align ourselves with him and with his son Jesus and with the kingdom that he's established. Don't let that opportunity pass you by. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar, falling on your face because you realize God is so amazing but then walking away unchanged. If you're sensing that impression of God, that power of God right now, and the need for Christ, we want to encourage you to do something about it, to confess your faith in Jesus and be baptized into him and live for him. Be a part of that kingdom. Let's stand together and sing.